You would be out of high school. Potentially out of college. Or signing up for grad school and more debt. Here's what I want you to do is, number one, you're not writing an essay. Shane, you got to know when you're going to write an essay. If you see lined paper waiting for you on that desk, that's that's when you know. Okay. If you just see a prompt, you're okay. If you see lined paper, you're right here. You're, 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 you, you should you have seen this. You were like running around screaming. I think someone like jumped out. Although it'd be pretty rare for you to have a prompt when you come in in the morning, because that would give you like an unfair 15 minute advantage. That, that except for those people who like forget to pick stuff up. <laughs> but whatever. Just um, really though. Really nice. Hey, I wasn't here yesterday. Like, so a whole day worth of commentary, I gave up. I need to get caught up on, on this stuff. Um, here's what I want you to do. Take, uh, take like four or five minutes. I want you to read, obviously, the prompt, and then take a look at, pa at the passage. And then we're going to talk about, okay, what do you like about this one? What don't you like? What seems similar to things that we have done already in this year? What seems very different? This is yours. Write on it. Mark it up. Um, at no point is Ethan ever going to write an essay about this. So today we're just talking about it. Um, but it's a different type of prompt from, from what we've been doing this year. So give yourself four or five minutes. Make sure you read this part and then read the passage. And then we're going to talk about it. All right, so what do we think of this prompt? Like it? What are you not doing? Might be the way to kind of start. Finding the twerk in the fight sauce. Is that what you like about it? Yes. That's, that's a... I'm sick of it. <laughs> Don't worry, you'll have more time for, for that kind of stuff. All right, so big thing here is, so just because you see a passage, you know, down here, you're not looking for rhetorical devices. Do you still need to read the passage? Absolutely, yes. Um, but you are not looking for rhetorical devices. Shay, the, I guess the hard question then is, well, what are you doing? Uh, you're like defending your opinion, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Um, important thing to look for any time you have, oh, come on, I already calibrated you. You're still isn't working. <laughs> Um, important thing to do is always look for the verb within the prompt. Like, what is it asking you to do? Um, so for this one, you really kind of have like two big options where you have to either, what can you do with Postman's assertion? You can agree or disagree. So essentially, your opinion, your argument is what you are going to be taking a look at. Um, this type of question I refer to as a DR. Q. So if I ever tell you, okay, you got a DRQ coming up, you know that that is going to be an argument-based question. Guess where you're going to encounter a DRQ? On the AP exam. And like throughout the course of the, you know, the, uh, the semester, obviously. Um, if you take a look in your course syllabus, you don't need to do it right now, you're going to have a DRQ when it comes to capture and arrive or that stuff. doesn't mean we're not going to talk about rhetorical devices because we still want to bring some sorrow to Shay's existence. Um, but when it comes to the essay for this one, and you'll have practice with one before we get to that point, we're going to be doing an argument based. So the question becomes, well, what's DRQ stand for? Any ideas? And you actually said one of the words. I'm pretty sure you said it. Yeah. So the D means that you would defend. R? is the opposite of defend. Refute. Good job, Kyle. And then there's the Q when people go, uh, question. not question. Not bad, though. Quote. Quote. No. Good answer to things, though. All of you have the first two letters correct. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> Qualify. OK? Um, what's it mean to defend? If you're going to put in a synonym, essentially it would be to support. You know, you're going to argue for something. If you're going to refute it, you are going to argue against it. So there would be disagreement taking place. Um, I think we have a definition for qualifying. Does 
That's kind of like a tricky one that the folks get stuck on. Yeah, I would say that would definitely be happening with, with this one. Um, there's still going to be an extra little angle that's going to take place. Who's picked out their homecoming dress or attire? Morgan hasn't? No. No. Okay. <laughs> Do you have like possibilities or is this a total blank slate? Total. How are you going to make this decision? To go shopping. Okay. What are you going to do? Um, go. How long is this process going to take you? Too long. Okay, that's what I was afraid of. <laughs> so essentially, by her shopping and this taking a few hours, what are, what are you probably going to be doing? So she is qualifying. She is going to be assessing multiple options. And for each one of those options, you're probably going to have a pro. And a con list, and you're ultimately going to weigh out which one is the best. She's basically qualifying. So if you defend something, you're 100% supporting it, no matter what. If you refute it, you're 100% going against it, no matter what. If you're qualifying it, it's not the you can go either way, so it's up for you to decide, but you basically outline the merits of both sides of the argument, or it could be multiple sides, it doesn't have to be just two. But these are the benefits, these are the drawbacks, Ultimately, this is the one that you would want to choose. The part that sometimes folks mess up when it comes to a qualification is they don't always choose the side. Here's the pros, here are the cons. So now you're better educated and they leave it at that. You still have to make a decision. So you still make a choice, but you ultimately see the merits of both sides. So I call these questions DRQs. You could call it an argument-based question because a lot of the times defend, refute, qualify tends to be the, the verbiage that they use. Um, but it's not always going to be that case, as you can see in, in this question. Um, but they'll always present you with some kind of argument, and you have to decide whether you are in favor or whether you are against it. It never matters whether you defend, whether you refute, whether you qualify. They're not going to go, oh, Hannah, you should not have defended. You were meant to refute this one. How dare you? Um, you always have the ability to choose. Every once in a while, there might be a unicorn question that will come around where it makes you qualify. Because it could word it in the way of evaluate the pros and the cons, but still ultimately make a decision. The easiest way to mess this up is to... Read the passage and look for rhetorical devices, because then you're totally doing the wrong thing. Um, or to never, ever really take a stance. Where is your evidence coming from? And that's why some people love this question, and that's why some people don't like the question, because you're responsible. And I'm not trying to make Shay like rhetorical analysis. But the one thing with rhetorical analysis is there's kind of like a safety blanket to it that you know the answer is going to be in the passage. There's a passage here, but the passage doesn't give you the answer. Uh, because if you just summarize the passage, you're not really taking a stance. You might take something, glean something from the passage and use that um, as like a springboard, but ultimately the evidence is going to reside with you. So folks like it because it gives you a lot of freedom. Johnny's evidence could be totally different than Alex's evidence. People also don't like it because I have to come up with real evidence, which, depending upon the prompt, could, could be a little tricky. Any questions about this? Not rhetorical devices, looking for evidence, looking for examples, looking for support, whatever kind of word you would want to go along with that. Um, Following passage, the contemporary social critic Neil Postman contrasts George Orwell's vision of the future as expressed in the novel 1984 and that of Aldous Huxley uh, in the novel Brave New World. Read the passage, considering Postman's assertion that Huxley's vision is more relevant today than is Orwell's, then using your own critical understanding of contemporary society as evidence, write a carefully argued essay that agrees or disagrees with Postman's assertion. Anything you like about the, uh, the prompt? With, uh, with Huxley and Orwell? Yeah. Okay, and so all throughout the passage, those two guys are, are being uh, compared to Trask. 
anything scare you about Huxley and Orwell being mentioned? Yeah, I actually did. But you did read that one. I know I did. 1984, not so much. Anyone in here besides me read 1984? I read a few. What? I read a few. A page? Okay. I'm reading the All right. Yeah, you'll have the option to read it in here. <laughs> Anyone in here not read Brave New World? Okay. Does that matter? No. At no time on the AP exam are you being assessed on what you've read or what you have not read, okay? In some ways, if you have read both books, no offenses, I think you could be at a disadvantage. Because what could happen that you might start using for support? Evidence from the books. Where do you have to get your evidence from per this prompt? Uh, yes, but what's the realm? Contemporary society. So your own critical understanding of contemporary society as evidence, and it's still going to be your brain, but you have to be coming from that realm as opposed from a literary realm. I chose this question because I remember feeling flustered when I took this test question. Because what was the first thought that went through my mind in 1997? It was May 9th, 1997, by the way. It's my birthday. Yeah. Oh, well. You know, it was what it was. Crap, I haven't read either book, was the initial reaction, which is a mistake. Not that, you know, I should have read the books, but that would have absolutely nothing to do because what does, what does uh, Postman do for us? Outlines what the whole entire argument pretty much is going to be. So if you come across something like this where it's talking about specific works, 1984, Brave New World, makes no difference. Take a look at what the issue is at hand. Um, ultimately, how would you like best summarize what, uh, what the author in the article is trying to get across so far as Huxley and Orwell? What's the difference between their viewpoints for, for like, their like, dystopian novels? Okay, so like the, the more the internal, the what we love will ruin us. Um, here, this is going to be more fear-based is, what, is what's going to ruin us. Um, here, what we love will ruin us. Um, who does the author, Postman, align with? Which one does he say is more relevant in contemporary society, Ethan? He's going Huxley. So his argument, and he's not really telling us examples from it, because that's going to be coming up from us, but, you know, really in the closing line, it's not always going to be this nice, neat, and simple, um, but in short, Orwell feared that what we hate will ruin us. Huxley feared that what we love will ruin us. And we already know that he already is aligning with Huxley. So the first decision, then, at that point, that you have to decide is, who do you agree with? that what we fear will ruin us, or do you think what we love will ruin us? And we're going to stay away from the both. You know, I don't want to stay away from qualifying. I want us to pick a side. Because even if you do qualify, you still have to choose one side over, over the other. So what do you think? Do you agree with Huxley? Do you agree with Orwell? Love, fear. I agree with Huxley. Do you agree with Huxley? Anyone thinking they definitely go Orwell? It doesn't matter. Kind of on the fence. Okay. I just have a question. Yep. So I would disagree with Postman's assertion by thinking that Orwell's his like argument is relevant but still think that Orwell's is just as relevant as Huxley's. You um 
So write a, yeah, write a carefully argued essay that agrees or disagrees with Postman's assertion. So you're asking, could I disagree with Postman that these two viewpoints are equally valid? Yeah. Yes, you could. Okay. You could. Um, and an important little nuance to keep in mind is you're not agreeing with Orwell. You're not disagreeing with Huxley or vice versa. It's Postman's assertion that he is more relevant in, in today. So yes, you could do that. And the one, the one thing, I don't want to make it sound like it's easier, like in an argument, and it kind of depends on how the argument is, is proposed. But, you know, if, if you're going, uh, red is the best color, defend, refute, qualify, you could refute that red is the best color, and you're not saying it's a bad color, but you could be going purple is just as nice, you know, kind of thing. So yes, that is a stance that you could do. Um, you, in some ways... Uh, I don't think it would make it harder, but you would definitely, if you're going to go that it's still as relevant, you know, or well as Huxley, you would definitely have to be able to support both. You know, you couldn't go, well, here's why it's just as relevant. Here's things from Orwell, Orwell, Orwell. If you're saying just as relevant, you would still have to tie in it to the, what we love. If you went, no, he's wrong, what we fear will ultimately ruin us, you know, external forces are going to be the ruination of civilization, then you could go all Orwell with it. It doesn't matter what you choose in the, the way that the prompt is worded. The thing that matters most, just like with rhetorical analysis, is evidence. In rhetorical analysis, it's the device, it's the explanation, and all that kind of stuff. Because it's argument-based, it's still the same thing. You're still coming up with a claim. You still came up with a claim with, uh, with East of Eden. You're still going to have support. It's just that it's going to be coming from the outside as opposed to the text itself. Um, Ethan, anything jumping up in your mind since you said I would go with Huxley? Like, as to a reason why you think things that we love could, could ruin us? I mean, I'm not sure how relevant it was in 1907. Well, and let's think of it as like 2000. Like, you're answering this today. So when we say contemporary society, we're talking 2000s. I mean, just the amount of technology. So the idea that it's forcing us to be lazy, not forcing us, but it's, it's kind of causing us to become lazy? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, what did you say along with that? Is that too hot? Yeah. Okay. You okay? It was an ugly face he made. We'll find out. All my faces are ugly. Um. You did Eminem as an example. Eminem. Was your example? Mental math. In the sense that what can, I assume, what can people not do as well anymore? Mental math, or yeah, math. Mental math dependency on calculators. What else? Going with that realm of technology. Because we can add other stuff, but, but we got a nice realm here. I mean, Google, really, part of speech is, is a noun, but what do we do with it now? We switch it into a verb. I'll Google it. I'll find it. I'll, I'll locate the answer. Um, I think it was open house last year, before open house was starting. A couple of us were English teachers were standing in the corner talking about nonsense, which is what we do. And one of the National Honor Society students, I forget who it was, but you know, the people who direct traffic was kind of standing there. And we were, I think we were trying to figure out how old Tom Cruise is. Yes. I don't remember why, but. Um, we were, so we were trying to figure it out. And she goes, why don't you just look it up? And we're like, that's the difference between you and us. We want to try to figure it out on our own. You just simply want to look it up. But we're going, out, okay, we know he was in this movie in 1983. Therefore, we think he was maybe around 21. Like maybe he was a little bit older. I bet he was born in this year trying to figure it out. So, you know, that idea that, hey, quick answer, yes, can get it. We have access to a whole bunch of information, facts, knowledge, but do we learn it? Do we know it? That's where it could be debatable. Do you have another one?
Okay. So not even like spell checker dependency, but just the way that, that writing has just changed. And one of the ironies of that, in 1984, you know, which he's talking about as, as a context, um, the English language is shrinking. They're taking words away. So it's not like good, better, best. It's good, double plus good. Actually, it's good, double good, double plus good. As opposed to having three different words, you just kind of put different prefixes on the word. Dictionaries every year get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's a different kind of thing, but in some ways we're doing that because words are literally getting smaller, 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 and now we don't even use words all the time. Why use a word when I have an emoji? I mean, a picture is worth a thousand words. So, you know, that could be something that you would absolutely be able to look at. Just don't write your essay on emojis. Can I back up? Okay, yeah, like it's, it's you, you can be like brave behind the screen that yeah. you might not necessarily say face to face with someone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, with companies like Uber Eats, DoorDash, Amazon Prime, you'll be your company. <laughs> your groceries are coming. Right? Instant Cart, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Mrs. Kane did Instant Cart this month. Really? Yeah. It's crazy. All of these coming to us. <laughs> that's, just, that's just crazy. So you were saying like Uber Eats? Yeah. Instant carts, or I forget if it's, I think it's Insta cart. But yeah, all those different the conveniences that were get okay. Virginia, one more? I was gonna say something similar, but also like thinking, I guess, like people do, like they advertise things where you don't need to think about it. Mm -hmm. So, like, when you're saying gaming, it's like video game, physical exertion, or mental thinking, and, and stuff like that. Okay. So, notice what we have here. One, two, three, really four, five, six. Can all of this fit into one paragraph? Probably not. I, it's, it's not going to be reasonable. But here would be the difference. If Ethan goes, technology is a reason why... Huxley's um, argument is more valid than Orwell. We love technology. Technology will ruin us. It's causing people to become lazy, and, you know, it's just going to be the ruination of society. You move on to the next one. But that's going to be a still a general response. That would be like saying Steinbeck uses figurative language or metaphors, but you never actually get into the examples of it. But if he can take two or three of these and now go into mental math, Google, you know, use of emojis, face-to-face -face communication going away, um, people becoming lazy and sitting on their couch playing games and then ordering food for them so that they can, you know, have it, and then going, Alexa, turn the lights on when it's starting to get dark. AI could end up being something, you know, that, that you kind of throw into here as well. Now you have specific evidence. And that's the tricky part, is coming up with something that is ultimately going to support that you explain. So kind of think of these as your examples of the rhetorical device that you're going to go, that you would go into detail about. You could, um, and, and, and the, uh, Libby, you said the communication part, you probably could make communication a separate kind of subtopic. So technology and communication end up being, you know, two things. I also think, especially with gaming um, being one, and, and you could argue cell phones in, in general, um, what kind of happens with gaming? What, that, that if it becomes too compulsive, it is an addiction. So you could have something where, say, one subtopic ends up being technology, another subtopic ends up being addiction. And it doesn't mean that it has to be technology-based, but, you know, what, what is an addiction? Something that you just cannot stop doing. 
doing. And at some point, not all the time, but at some point, it probably was something that you liked. Maybe you loved, you know, but it's probably something that you liked. Video games. Super Mario Brothers was the best video game in 1988. I just love that game. Actually, Super Titan Roll, that's a whole other story. And, you know, now you're addicted to playing Fortnite or whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and it's... And it's not that you have to pick something that would tie in to Huxley, and it's not that you would be punished for picking something that comes from Huxley. You could certainly reference Soma. You just don't want that to become the basis of the argument because you're losing that contemporary society. But if you go, you know, the opioid crisis in today's world, or vaping is kind of like what was going on with Soma, now you have something that you could certainly work with. So, you know, for addictions, you could certainly put video games... You know, there could be substance abuse. What other kind of addictions people have? Alcohol. Yeah. Social media. I made the mistake of sending out the Calvin napkin before bedtime story time. So we're reading Junie B. Jones, and now my watch is buzzing. I was good. I did not look to see what was going on. But there's certainly, you know, you've been in situations where notifications, I have to look, you know, type thing. So media, entertainment, um, notifications, you know, could simply be an addiction. Gambling could end up being an addiction that people have. Food. I mean, I could go see Morgan every night. Get that. What was my flavor? I expect when I show up next time, it's just, here you go. Here's your chocolate raspberry truffle, Mr. Kane. Two scoops. You're good to go. Thank you. That's a good one. So, with this one, if I went with technology, I went with addiction, I have examples pulling from contemporary society of things that we love that could be the ruination of us. Doesn't matter what those subtopics are, I have to be able to go into detail with that. And that's where that evidence is, is again coming from. So in some ways, and not again trying to make sure you go, boy, rhetorical analysis really is nice. While you're reading a passage uh, for rhetorical analysis, you're probably starting to kind of pick up on what are some devices. And there's still a lot of work to do with it. For this one, you're reading the passage to kind of figure out what the argument is. Then you got to go back into the brain, into the mental Rolodex, and try to figure out what some topics would be. I don't know if this is good news or bad news. I think you would consider it to be good news. The, the DRQ, more often than not, and by that I mean like well more often than not, probably 90% of the time, you won't have a passage. It'll just give you a statement. Defend, refute, qualify. You know, so social media has improved communication. Not saying that's a path, I don't think that's been a prompt they've ever used, but you could have, you know, defend if you qualify that social media has improved communication. And then you'd have to explain why you are agree with it or why you would disagree. Generally speaking, the categories of support tend to be historical examples, contemporary society, and you can usually also go with literature. Um, but this is something, and I know this one's from 22 years ago, but they still do it quite a bit, where that contemporary society as a whole is something that you'll kind of see. Um, not tomorrow, on Thursday, there's going to be another prompt when you come in. It's not going to be an essay, there won't be one paper by it. But I'll give you a more recent one so we can kind of do a little bit of a compare contrast between this one and, and the uh, uh, a more recent one. We will do a DRQ. Um, and the next time we do it, it'll be a TWA. But when you have, when we do that one, I'll give the prompt to you ahead of time. So you'll have some time to kind of think about it, digest it. You're not going to be doing it on the spot in those 40 minutes. You'll be writing in 40 minutes, but you'll have time to kind of think about what it is you want to do. Um, but that's still off. That's, that's not like happening next week. And so you're reading, you have Catcher, and then also those two Buckford Reader articles. Um, both of which are like four or five pages, so they're not over the only one. That one again is the front. Okay, nothing between that one. Very wide if you need to worry. Okay.
Have a good one. See ya. You too. What's that? Her hair looks so good. It's still good. Yeah. You too. Come on. You as well.